Hello, everybody. It's two o'clock. And um, for most of us, it's two o'clock. I don't know where everybody is. Um, you may have a different time zone. I know at least one of our panelists is in a very different time zone. So we are really happy and excited to be having this panel today on group biography. And we have some wonderful speakers today who will uh, talk to us about their work and have a conversation about group biography. We'll talk for about 45 minutes, but you should be willing and happy to put your questions into the chat and we'll try to ask as many of them, of them as we can get to and see if we can respond to them. If something particularly relevant comes up while we're talking, we may pop in there. So bear with me because I'll be monitoring the chat as well as the conversation. So it may take me a, a moment to get to everything. I'm really excited to, to introduce our people who are talking today and I'm very grateful for them to them for agreeing to be part of this today and be part of bio. Their biographies, their bios are online. So I'll give a little bit of a shortened version, but they will also talk a bit more about current projects, things that they're working on, things they've done in the past. And I hope we'll have a wonderful conversation and we look forward to seeing your questions and to talking to them. So with us today in alphabetical order are David Haydu, who is a three-time finalist for the National Books Critics Circle Award. He's the author of the group biography, Positively Fourth Street, The Lives and Times of Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Mimi Baez Farina, and Richard Farina. His biography of Billy Strayhorn, Lush Life, was named one of the 100 best nonfiction books of all times, all time by the New York Times. And his latest book, Adrian Geffel, is a satirical oral history of a fictional composer. His work in progress is a group biography of three vaudeville stars in graphic form. Daisy Hay is the author of Young Romantics, the Shelley's Byron and Other Tangled Lives for which she was awarded the Rosemary Crochet Prize by the British Academy and Mr. and Mrs. Disraeli, A Strange Romance for which she received a Somerset Mom Award. Her current project, a group biography entitled Dinner with Joseph Johnson will be published in 2022. She is an associate professor in English literature and life writing at the University of Exeter in England and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. And Andrew Meyer is the author of two award-winning books, Black Earth, A Journey Through Russia After the Fall, widely hailed as one of the best books on Russia to appear since the end of the USSR, and The Lost Spy, an American and Stalin Secret Service, a biography of the first known American to spy for the Soviets. Both were named to numerous book of the year lists. Meyer is the recipient of numerous fellowships and is at present at work on a biography of the Morgenthau family <clears throat> forthcoming from Random House. So welcome, wonderful speakers, wonderful biographers, wonderful group biographers, and um, we'll talk about our works. I, I'm gonna start by just saying that in my own work, I've had to make the shift from writing biographies of, sing of a single subject to that of writing about a group. And I wonder if anybody has done that or done it even in reverse, gone from group biography to a single subject and um, what the challenges and joys or problems are. What are there different ways you need to approach a group biography rather than a single subject one? Well, I'm, I'm, maybe I could start because my, my first book was a biography of, of a single subject, uh, Billy Strayhorn. And I spent over a decade uh, doing that. And in the end, I realized that it was essentially a group. It was a, it was a biography of multiple figures, principally the name, the uh, person on the cover of the title, uh, Billy Strayhorn, and his main collaborator, Duke Ellington, and a number of other collaborators with, with which he worked. And my experience with that, with that uh, made me acutely aware of how collaborative creative uh, lives are and how collaborative the creative process are. And it was virtually impossible to disentangle Strayhorn from the, his, you know, his, his web of collaborators. Uh, so that led me to try to dive into that process in, in another book. I thought, well, 
uh, let me just try to deal with the uh, dynamics between people and how relationships between people inform art. Since that was such an important part of the first book, I'll try to do that with another book. And that's why I chose a group biography of four people whose lives were entwined in the 1960s in a variety of ways. So I could come back and talk more about that. But, but it was the experience of doing, doing a, a biography of a single person and realizing that there's sort of no such thing <laughs> that led me to do the group biography. Daisy, your first book was a group biography. It was, uh, but I think it came out of that same sense that I, before I wrote the book, I'd been working on a PhD on quite kind of literary academic things to do with collaboration and the shed circle around Percy Bysshe Shelley and the journalist Lee Hunt, so, you know, romantic poets and their circles. And the whole time I was writing it, I felt like the backstory, the thing that brought these hands together on manuscripts that put these people in the same room, editing journals, competing with each other, writing sonnets to time in competition with each other, something that Shelley and Keats did. That that story about how all these people were in the, in the same rooms, in the same fields, in the same places, was really, really interesting to me. So I've moved from writing about groups to writing about a pair, so then writing about a kind of collection of people now who aren't, couldn't really be described as a group. They're a kind of people who are connected via an individual. So I agree that all you know, those different kinds of writing have different challenges. But I think for me, they're all linked by that sense that, you know, we live in an interdependent world and particularly the kind of creativity that has always been interested in me. Literary creativity is never a single person sitting in a room. And that that is the common theme, I think. And Andrew, your, is this, it's your current project, your first group biography of your books? It is, but it's a really good question um, uh, because actually I'm listening to David and Daisy and I'm actually thinking, you know, biography in itself is a fiction. Uh, you know, when you, we are sitting in the archives or when we're reading or we're looking at letters, letters in themselves are not, even if you're uh, a woman or a man sitting in a room writing a letter, you're, you're, there's obviously two people on the page at least. And it's a fiction in the sense that um, even when I wrote uh, my first biography, which I did um, uh, in large part um, at the Leon Levy Center for Biography uh, about a young man named Isaiah Augins, I could have easily, Daisy, written about, and I, I researched uh, perhaps more about his wife, uh, who was also a spy for the Soviets. And it was an absolutely arbitrary decision, really right from the beginning. In fact, maybe it wasn't a decision. It was one of those impulses that we all have when we have to give birth to a project um, to focus on him, because it really is, in fact, a family biography. There's also a son involved in that book who's still alive. Um, but it is a fiction in the sense that that is the genre. And it, I think it's infinitely more difficult, at least it is in my case, to have attempted a family biography. And uh, uh, David and Daisy, who have done it and are doing it, uh, I think I'd love to hear more about how you feel in terms of managing the complexities, um, whether it's a creative person or a collaborative person, Billy Sharon, or whether it's a romantic poet, a uh, publisher, or whether it's in my current project, um, the guy uh, who was the DA for about 100 years um, of Manhattan, Robert Morgenthau. Because yes, he was, uh, there is the challenge of animating a, a man sitting in a room. Um, and yet uh, so much of his legacy and power extended far beyond that. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Could I, could I ask a question of Andrew? Uh, Andrew, when you talk about the evidence of archival materials, such as letters and such, being a fiction, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean it's a, a construction or a projection, or do you mean it's an untruth? You know, what do you mean? No, I meant really just quite literally. literally. Um, when I was very young, uh, I went to go hear a talk, um, which I had forgotten about until a friend of mine uh, reminded me of the landscape photographer Ansel Adams. And Ansel Adams, as most of you know, uh, was a famous landscape um, uh, photographer, mainly in Northern California. And he, all the beautiful images of Yosemite, the massive images of Yosemite. 
And I remember as a young, you know, I was probably eight or nine years old in San Francisco. And someone asked him, why do you never take photographs with people in them? And I remember distinctly, he said, there's always two people in every photograph I take. There's you and there is I, the photographer. And that's what I mean about the letter is that you're, you're not just looking at uh, the person in my case, you know, one of the Morgenthaus, you're also considering as Daisy was saying, well, the family, the correspondence, the context, that what, it, what is the rest of that that's not on this page, okay? Uh, and then of course, many years later, um, we try to write the life story. And I love the phrase, which I would hope we would adopt in this country, just a plug for life writing, because that's really what biography is, of course, life writing. Um, and that's what I meant, David. And not, that, not to question the, uh, um, it's nothing as interesting as that, as questioning you know, the veracity of a letter, which, which that too we can get into. I find that idea of a fiction really, really useful, because I think I have this idea because I've only written about groups that writing about groups is a place where the kind of fiction, which is the biographer's frame is explicit because, you know, where you point your camera, how you select your material, who you focus on anyone's view, you, the hand of the biographer feels to me to be very evident in group biography, you know, these choices around selection, focus, attention, and, you know, therefore your kind of freedom to, tell a story with a you know, particular kind of set of preoccupations. I and mean, I'm not saying that all biography is autobiography, but it's a place where you can see that the hand of the biographer, the preoccupations of the biographer in those kind of matters of selection. I suspect, however, that that is true too of writing single subject biographies. It's just less evident because there is a kind of framework of a life to follow. But I find that idea of, of a fiction quite liberating because in fact, you know, all you can ever do is hew your own account of a collection of lives out of archival material. And you have to then own the authenticity of that. You know, the groups I've written about are constructed by me. Um, and it's right. no good to suggest otherwise, I think. Mm -hmm. That liberty carries with it some risks at, that we need to be uh, uh, conscious of too, uh, and need to be careful to uh, still value the truth that is somewhere in the complex that evidence is part of. You know, it's still, and to not think of, uh, not to focus too much on the unreality of it or the unfactuality of it or the falseness of it. And because uh, that, could, that could free us up to maybe go too far in applying our own imaginations uh, to the work and uh, lose touch with the importance of honoring the truth, you know, uh, and the, the truth in the, our subjects' lives and the relationships between our subjects and group biographies and the complexity of those relationships. Sometimes the complexities are so daunting that there's a kind of comfort in the, treating them creatively, you know, Okay, I have the freedom to like make of this what I what what I will, but that could take us, I think, too far from the the, the complexities of the reality, and we have to be careful. I, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I, one of the things I'm really interested to hear from Andrew and David is that for me, as a scholar, primarily of the long 18th century, you know, my world was built with paper. You know, nothing that I ever write, well, I I would never write a sentence which I can't find. And yeah, you know, I can't find the, the fact in the archive. Um, yeah, this is a world completely constructed by documents, me as a scholar in the archive. But when you write on subjects which are more recent, when you're talking to people who have memory, you know, who, where you're talking to, to, witness, to living witnesses, I imagine that those boundaries around your sources must be much more complex. So they, you don't have the comfort of this paper world to retreat to, to create your story out of. Mm -hmm. That was actually a question I was going to have um, about the difference between people you can actually interview whose opinions may differ from what you're finding in letters or from each other's and what it's like to, to write either about a living or a recently living subject or group. Um, and what the difference is when we try to put that 
together because I know that you talk to three friends about what happened in a party, you're going to get three different versions. So how does that work if you're working with um, much more recent subjects and you don't have to sit by yourself, you and the letter in the archive? I, I can jump in. It, uh, it was one of the, it's, a, it's again another great question. It was one of the, the main impetuses I had in choosing a living subject. And I cast around because I had spent for four or five years chasing ghosts um, and working on this book about uh, Oggins uh, and working in uh, Russian archives, working in the US archives in the UK and, uh, and in Japan, China. And at any rate, I thought, well, I'm going to work with someone who's alive. It's going to be so much easier. Boy, was I wrong. Um, for, for exactly the reasons uh, uh, you mentioned, Gretchen, but it's not just three people in the room, depending, of course, on whom uh, you're trying to, uh, whose life you're trying to write or delve into. It's also, so we're having a conversation with however 50, 60 people, but then somebody says, and when we go back and we try to create that conversation, someone will say, well, I know you talked to Daisy and Daisy told you this. That's not what happened. So you're getting refraction. And this, especially in a world where it's about New York and regarding the Morgenthau family and very contentious issues, whether they be the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, the Morgenthau plan, or the Central Park Jogger case. It's a crazy book that I've undertaken. Um, but all of those issues are very much alive. They may not be contemporary, um, all of them, but the living witnesses and the stakeholders uh, all are deeply aware of your meddling and your interpreting and that kind of uh, selectivity that Daisy's talking about in your perspective. I mean, we all have subjectivity, what we leave um, in and what we, what we leave out. Um, so it, uh, it's, it's, I think it's actually much more difficult um, to write about, uh, for me at least, living subjects. Um, and I will say though, to Daisy's earlier point that I read Jenny Uglow's um, uh, biography of Charles II uh, early on in this process. And uh, although it's absolutely archival based, it's absolutely based on uh, fact, and on paper, it, you know, the cliche of uh, Midtown, what used to be Midtown Manhattan publishing, it reads like a novel uh, because there's voice, there's character, there's tone, there's drama, uh, it's, there's everything you'd want. And, you know, this tips the scale back. It may be easier uh, to research it, but I think it, the challenge of writing, uh, whether it be the 17th, 18th or 19th century uh, may, may be even harder. You know, it's just that much more difficult. Is it necessary to like all the subjects that you're writing about? Because when you're writing a biography, the old saying was pick somebody you really are interested in because by the end, you might not like them as much um, by the time you've learned more, but then you have more chances of, of, you know, a kind of emotional response to some other people in the, in the group. I don't know if that has become an issue um, for any of you. What about you, David? You wrote about a 60s yeah, time. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I have some, I have some thoughts on that. I, I, I actually have a thought on the previous question uh, too I'd like to make, and that's that I, I think that uh, subject dict, each subject dictates its own form and also its own methodology, you know, and a combination of methodologies, journalistic method doing uh, interviews with living subjects, and uh, research and analysis uh, is kind of the ideal. I've often thought that uh, that historians doing recent history would uh, would be better off if they made more phone calls, and that journalists would be better off if they read more. You know, but generally generally uh, speaking, the, the subject of my first book uh, consciously tactically, strategically avoided the spotlight and left an inaccurate trail. So the historical record on my first subject was just wrong and grossly misleading. So I had to construct his life from the uh, first testimony of the firsthand witnesses of that, that life, and then put that together with what was reliable in the historical record. But in the absence of 
interviews with the firsthand witnesses of the life, I never would have been able to tell the story of, you know, of Billy Strayhorn. Now, in my, in my the book I recently finished, it'll be published in the, published in the fall, is about vaudeville. Uh, and, you know, there's literally no one alive who, you know, who saw these subjects uh, in person. And it needed to be done uh, through, you know, archival and historical research. And I still found untold stories to tell there because the story of the relationship between the characters had never been told. And there are aspects of their life that are very much of the 21st century that we can understand better from our point of view than better than they were, than these subjects were uh, uh, understood at their time. But as for, um, do you have to like the subject? I think that liking or not liking or thinking somebody's good or bad is a little, you know, reductive and not that helpful. I think you have to care about the subject. You, in the, you have to care deeply about the subject in order to do the subject justice. Uh, you know, I've written about people who I went in liking and ended up not liking so much, but I, care, but I think my care about them only grew uh, to the benefit of the work. And there were a couple of cases when I was working on projects and I realized at a certain point, I am not comfortable enough with this subject to do that subject justice. And I withdrew, I withdrew from Two books. I, I went through. I had a big contract to do a book about Martin Scorsese with Farrah Strauss and Drew, and I spent several years working on it. I had an advance that I spent that I had to repay. <laughs> <laughs> repay. I, I, after a couple of years, I realized he's too controlling. I, I could never do the kind of book I want to write. I would want to write about this particular person. Somebody else. You know, I. It, it, this he. This will be his book and there's no room for me so I withdrew. Uh, I completely so I, agree about caring you have to I there are people I've written about who I don't think I want to spend an evening with but whose work yeah. I like and I care about enormously but I think what presents a challenge is there are some figures who are just so powerful that it's easy in a group biography to let them suck the oxygen out of the story. And I remember when I was writing my first book, Young Romantics, about the Shelleys and about the circle around them, Shelley himself was that kind of figure. He was, he was so magnetic as a figure, his, archive, his voice in the archive, that it was very easy to lose sight of what I was trying to do, which was actually not to put him center stage. And I was also at that point edited by Paul Eli at FSG, who taught me an enormous amount about how to structure a book. We edited it together and he said, he said, Shelley's like Martin Amos, you know, yeah, he kind of, he's taking all the attention in this party. And there was a feeling of relief when Shelley died and the kind of space opened out for the other figures. And lots of the people I've written about behave in ways which are incredibly cruel, you know, but actually that's part of, you know, part of the interest. There's a question that's come up in the chat about, do you assign roles, hero, villain, catalyst? And I felt it was really important in that book in particular, not to turn the romantic poets into kind of villains who victimize you know, women who are uh, become the kind of, you know, tragic poster girls for, the, for, the, for their own moment. Yeah, it felt really important not to assign roles, but to read this material with respect and paying due, complex, due attention to the complexity with which people live their lives and that no one lives their life in a, in a role like that straightforwardly and that felt really important to me to acknowledge you know, the kind of the failings but also the kind of that, that question about relationality that David was talking about that everything happens in relation and you can't you can't fit a kind of a pro forma character role onto that. When I read Young Romantics when it first came out I remember thinking, well, we've all read biographies of these people if we're interested in this period. What's the difference? Are we just like a pastiche putting together the other things that we know about them? Or are we creating some new kind of dynamic and that sheds some light on the subject that couldn't be shed you know, on it without having them in relationship to 
each other. And I, I think that I, I learned a lot. You know, I thought, oh, I know all about Shelley. But now I learned something new because I could see him from other people's perspectives, other people's points of view, see him interacting with people in a different way. And um, for those of you who've worked on more modern periods and you could see some of the relationships, you know, the Farinas and now the Morgenthau family, um, uh, it, it must shed some light when you start to put them in, in conversation with the people that they were at, really in conversation with. Does it change? What you, the way you approach that when you realize you're doing something um, that is, is somebody in the chat said the distinction between a group biography and a collective biography. Maybe we can tackle that question and then see what happens and when that, you put these people together. Yeah, and and um, also the the last uh, at least the last on my chat question about, um, but isn't every good biography actually a group biography? That kind of mm. brings us back where we start. Um, yeah. that that's what I meant about the fiction um, uh, that yeah it is um, it could be a good group biography or a collective biography but not necessarily a family biography I don't know although Joan Baez and company I think um, uh, when I read Positively Fourth Street I actually mentioned Northern California I grew up um, I guess in the shadow of David Harris and Joan Baez um, and I learned a great deal in that kind of refracted light, that same sense of, you know, these people do not live, it's, it's, it's obvious, no one lives uh, in, well, some of us in the last year and a half have, in complete isolation, um, but certainly not then, um, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and I think that that kind of a group biography um, is certainly a challenge, whether you're drawing on uh, journalistic interviews, uh, or historical archival research. Um, but it is, a, uh, so there was a question in the chat that we needed to address. Gretchen, is there uh, another one? No, Sorry. somebody wanted to know if there's a difference between group or collective biography. And I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm just throwing it back to you. Well, any of you, if you can yeah, see. If... Speaking from my experience, Positively Fourth Street was a biography of the group. It wasn't for biographies kind of, you know, shuffled together like cards or it wasn't a collage of four lives where we come in and out, uh, you know, where the lives come in and out of view. Uh, I just kind of made a, a rule for myself to guide me when I was constructing the book that uh, I would deal only with ways in which, mostly, not only, but mostly with ways in which the at least two of these figures uh, affected each other in a meaningful way. And so that most of the scenes would involve two and uh, in a way where, you know, the result is a consequence of their, of their dynamic. They had some impact on each other and that, gave me an opportunity to explore all kinds of ways in which uh, relationships influence the making of art. You know, competition between sisters is, is specific, competition between you know, males in the 1960s was something specific. Uh, amorous relationships, relationships driven by Eros as well as Ardor, you know, introduce additional elements. So there are all these uh, elements that influence the dynamics that influence the people that led to art of a certain kind and then an effect on the culture of a certain kind. So you know, I, I was working from the dynamics out, you know, in the absence of dynamic, there's sort of nothing in the, not, I shouldn't say nothing, there's very little in the book that's just about Joan Baez or just about you know, Bob Dylan or just about Mimi Baez. So that, that was, that was my method. It was partly a way of just being able to find a way to contribute something unique uh, from a number of lives in an era that had been so thorough, that had been written about before. So it's a way that I could, you know, make some kind of a contribution. So you're talking about narrative structure, I think. And I think that's something that all of you it must have had to deal with in a different way when you have a group biography. Uh, how have you, the, the rest of you talked about narrative structure when it's in a group biography? 
And Andrew, I imagine you're still doing that. <laughs> uh, well, no, thank goodness, knock on wood, uh, I'm not so doing it. I'm, I'm finishing editing, but it's a, it's a massive book. It's actually five books. So, David, you, you, you got me a little worried when you said collage, and it's definitely not a collage, but it could have it's been. Fine. It's, um, fine. it's fine. No, the, 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 kiss, the kiss of something was when Robert Carroll said several years ago when I was at the, uh, the Levy Center, he said, well, maybe it's three volumes. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Children, I want to say married. Um, and um, there was a question in the chat though that was interesting about, uh, about narrative structure and the narrative engine. And do you look at people um, either when you're researching or when you're writing as villains, heroines, um, uh, who's gonna be, have a cameo, who's gonna stay in the wings? And um, uh, both David and, and Daisy alluded to this. I had to deal with um, uh, larger than life people. And it's when Daisy was talking about well tread ground, or Dave was talking as well. You know, um, Bob Dylan, and then you know Richard Farina. Well, who's better known? Um, in my case, it could be Woodrow Wilson and Henry Morgenthau, um, or it could be FDR and Churchill. And then who's this glowering, very grim, uh, prematurely bald guy who was the longest-serving cabinet member, still is, I think, in U.S. history, who I discovered. It wasn't that uh, well buried. Not only failed out of Cornell twice, actually never graduated high school. Um, he flunked out uh, of his prep school. And every time, Daisy, Churchill, Eleanor Roosevelt, or FDR, they steal all the light and the oxygen on the stage. And I had to write and write and write. And then you know, uh, I'm not one who cries uh, over uh, cutting. There's certainly plenty of words left in the book. Um, but some of the, my most beloved scenes when I had to cut, you know, either Mrs. R or FDR out, because of course they weren't the focus. Um, partly it's the known history. Uh, and therefore when you cut what is the unknown history it becomes much clearer and hopefully uh, should shine. Um, and then, you know, so uh, Henry Morgenthau was with FDR on his last night. So the scene uh, of that death scene, I think, is it's been written hundreds, if not thousands of times. And I hope, uh, as David just said, to contribute something new. Um, similarly, his son, Robert Kennedy, was with Bobby Kennedy when the news came from Dallas. He was right with him. Uh, and so we're not in Dallas with JFK. We're with Bobby Kennedy, which is a very different scene. Um, it's that same kind of sense of, you know, where is my spotlight and where must my characters be? Uh, and it is, it, is an, it is a very difficult challenge. That question of structure is absolutely central to the, the, the process for me. I mean, I will spend months and months and months and months and months with every book working on structure. I put every source into enormous Excel spreadsheets because I am in fact a geek. And then out of these thousands and thousands of chronological sources, I structure a story. And with the book about the Disraelis, it was people tend to write about the Disraelis in a structure which maps the ebb and flow of his political career. And it was really important when writing about their marriage to find a structure in the archive from the sources which took its ebb and flow, took its points of climax and you know falling away from kind of emotional cruxes of things that happened on paper between them. And now I'm writing about a group who are not really a group. I mean, the idea of a collective biography is quite useful. It's a, it's a collection of people who are joined through an individual who passed through a publishing house in London in the 18th century. It has a cast of around about 60, and it's a kind of cultural history of this period of enormous change in, in Britain and in Britain's relationship with America, told through its people. And the structuring principle there has had to be a kind of sense of, you know, a kind of ideas about thread or about how you can take a thread of a life and you can follow it through and you can look about who, who comes into the room and who comes out of the room what happens you know, in the conversations, what happens on paper. And for a book on that scale with that number of people, I've had to take my structuring principles from my own cast. So one of the people I write about is Joseph Priestley, who is kind of absolutely central to my story. And Priestley came up with this idea of the chart of biography. He said, if you put all famous lives on a chart, which you tabulate on a timeline from you know, 
600 AD to Priestley's present, you will find out who was in the room, you know, who was present, who was nearby when Newton you know, thought about the apple. And he created these enormous charts, which were teaching aids, and they're beautiful. You can look at them in the British Library. I mean, they take up table after table. Um, and he just puts people next to each other and he sees what happens, you know, what happens in that moment of chemistry. So I've had to kind of, for this book, make my own chart of biography to say what happens when you elide these lives, when you have Mary Wollstonecraft exchanging letters with Erasmus Darwin, or when William Cooper and Henry Fuseli, you know, two huge figures, are talking over a manuscript. Yeah, and to look for these moments of kind of magnetism between people and say, what does that then tell us about a changing country? So it's much more complicated, but until I had that structure, until I felt like I had that story, there was nothing I could do with this material. And I guess that comes back to what I was saying about fiction. You know, that we create, that, that is the best bit for me, that the creativity of having to find that story out of the material. One thing that's struck out of your me. Excel sheet. Sorry, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that struck me with all of your work so far is that you're also recreating a place and time, not just a person, but a kind of long moment in time or a cultural moment. Is that really central to what you're trying to do um, with your work? Because I can see everything you've been saying seems to suggest that it's the 60s, it's what was happening in New York. It is um, an influential person who sets a tone for the period in some way. Is that something you think about? You know, I think uh, I've always tried to have each one of my books be, you know, three or four books, you know, to do, to do three or four different things, to be, to, uh, uh, to be a story, to be character study, to be a landscape book, and to be an in inquiry, into, inquiry into a set of questions, set, uh, set of ideas. So, you know, I've always sought to do multiple things, and one of them is to evoke a time and place. So I found something interesting in my case, now that I've done, you know, half dozen books, is that at the time, I thought each one was unique. So I thought when I'm writing Lost Life, it's a book about a gay black man in the, the, the New York in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. My, my mother-in-law, who's a uh, philosophy professor, read it, and she said afterward, "Oh my God, David, it, it's you." I, and uh -huh. I said, "What?" You know, <laughs> and you know, I I think what she found was that I. There were things about Strayhorn that I connected with that were the reasons that one among the reasons that I cared about him that she recognized. But then I wrote about the 60s. It's a you know another part of the 20th century and you know different sphere of aesthetic work and different cultural sphere, different political sphere, and four different people. Uh, and I thought it's very different. Then I wrote about comic books in the 1950s, and now I just wrote about vaudeville. And then I wrote a book of fiction, it's called A Fiction. Adrian Geffel is a fictional, it's a fictional work of nonfiction. So even though it's formally fiction, it has the structure of nonfiction. But I look at them all now and I realize that they're all about young people coming to New York and trying to find themselves through a form of art. And I look at them now and I said, I just spent all my entire life trying to figure <laughs> myself out. You know, and I look at the, and I look at that and I say, well, that's a, maybe that that's a little uh, too self-absorbed. You know, maybe I've made some mistakes in that in, in that kind of fixation. Uh, but there's still time to do a couple more books, so maybe I could <laughs> maybe I could correct things. But there's a little bit, yes, different time period, different set of people, different set of social circumstances, political circumstances, but we all bring, can't help but bring ourselves to the work. It's not quite what you asked, but it's- That's now. okay. Um, yeah, you know, I'm gonna, we've only got a few minutes left before we really turn to the chat and have people um, con contribute and ask questions. So I, I wanted to just shift for a second and say something about women. Um, one of the things that, you do is find 
sometimes somebody who seems to have been lost or forgotten or not brought into the story or not been seen as part of the group and part of the job is to make them equal participants in this group biography. I know Daisy did it with Young Romantics, particularly um, when you, and that you found material on um, Disraeli's wife that people had been overlooking. I know the rest of you have done similar things as well. So there is something about, it may be the archival work or things that are sitting in archives that nobody's read or paid attention to. Um, and there's, there are a way that writing about women is, is a little different because of either archival things or past approaches to them. Andrew, you're nodding, so I'm hoping yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it was one of the first challenges, and I'll spare you the details, but I went to go see um, uh, the, the, the brilliant and late uh, uh, Alice Mayhew when I still was sort of thinking about this book. And I stayed up till about three in the morning, Gretchen, thinking the night before exactly that question. You know, the Morgenthaus to I, that I sort of knew in the, the recesses of my memory growing up was the secretary of the treasury and the DA. I was amazed to know that he was still the DA of Manhattan, but he was then in 89. And I thought, well, what about the women? Uh, because when I started interviewing, of course, I found, maybe not of course, I found the most intelligent, the most forthcoming, uh, and really the best sources were the women, not just in the family, but the women who worked either in the DA's office or, or had worked uh, with um, his father and the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and that was the first question Alice asked, what about the women? And as any of us uh, on this call knows, if you worked in archives, uh, and this is certainly true for the students um, at the new school that I mentor who are working in um, Black uh, American studies. The paper is not always there. And the women, uh, women are not only um, forgotten, sometimes deliberately erased and written out of the history. And that was certainly the case in the Morgenthau um, story. And it was a challenge that right from the beginning, I sort of said, OK, like David, I know something about this world. But the real fun, I think we can all agree, is that however much of us individually is in the work, is in the research, is in the history, uh, right, grappling and wrestling with these issues, it's the exploration, it's the learning, it's what we don't know, the surprises in the archives. And I think there was a question, something like this in the, uh, in the chat. Um, someone asked about what was the mystery that you, know, you either couldn't find, you couldn't solve that came up in the archives. And it was exactly, that's why I was nodding, Gretchen, because it's, uh, um, I think it's in the book. I certainly hope it is. Uh, uh, I, Henry Morgenthau never graduated. He was dyslexic. He had a host of problems, but he was a brilliant bureaucrat. He resided in, and presided and cre helped create the New Deal and the greatest bureaucracy. He was the greatest spender uh, in American history to date, et cetera, et cetera. And yet he told his family and his few one or two friends, it was all thanks to my wife. She was the guts, she was the intelligence, she had the vision. So I was searching and searching and searching. And I found a speech, which I, I found notes for a speech in 1926. And I thought, this is like, uh, at the time it was Hillary Clinton, but it could be Elizabeth Warren today. She stood up and spoke to a group of upstate Republicans. And it was brilliant. It took me a long time to realize this was not her husband. This was in fact his wife, Eleanor Morgenthau. And then in the diaries, which are millions and millions of pages long, the Morgenthau Diaries, she's there, she's there. But in the three volume of the Morgenthau Diaries, which is behind me, she's not there. She's completely excised. Um, and, and there's a reason why she and Eleanor Roosevelt were so close and very, very close comrades, uh, not just personally, but in the policies as well. And even in the great Eleanor biography, Eleanor Roosevelt biographies, Eleanor Morgenthau is not there. So it's not always, um, uh, it's not, it's never simple, but it's a very good question. It's one of the things that I've focused on really since even before I started uh, researching. Thank you. I know I, that, yeah, yeah, Daisy has had to deal with this as well. Yeah, my answer to that question also relates to the question in the chat about mysteries, because I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it's what's not kept. And with the Disraelis, we have 
we have 50,000 bits of paper related to the Disraelis. And the reason we have many of them is because Marianne Disraeli kept everything. I mean, she kept everything Disraeli wrote of which she was aware. And after he di she died, Disraeli found this archive of his life, including every lock of hair. She'd kept a lock of hair from every haircut she'd given him over the 30 years of their marriage. And she'd cut his hair. So he found box every two weeks. So he found boxes of his hair. But no one did that for her. So, you know, what you're faced with, particularly at points of great crisis in their relationship, is often you'd have his account, but you'd only have the most elliptical version of her account. And I was very influenced by the work of Janet Bezier, who talks in her book, Thinking Through the Mothers, around the idea that there is a kind of version of biography of women, which is about salvation biography, which is about filling those silences. And actually it was quite important to me to demarcate those places of silence and unknowability, but not necessarily to impose my own voice. But what I did is I found in Mary Ann's archive, Mary Ann Disraeli was a great collector of papers. She collected stories of women, including women whose stories the archive doesn't relate the end of. So she collected the story of a woman who disappeared, who le left her life, a Miss S, who left her life one morning with her maidservant, and, you know, left her respectable Victorian household and was never seen again. And I tracked her through newspapers and I, you know, and there was no answer. We, you know, the archive doesn't reveal the answer to some of these stories. So in my book, what I tried to say is some of these, the stories of these women, which are captured in the kind of archival ephemera and boxes of hair and, you know, notes written on the back of receipts and things which might seem to have less status as documents and sources. You have to, you have to, there is a kind of politics to acknowledging the mystery, to acknowledging the things which aren't knowable, and to saying this is part of the condition of how these women's lives have been recorded, rather than to kind of fill that silence, to fill that kind of noisy silence with your own attempt to bring some kind of parity to the story. That, that was a balance I thought I had to negotiate quite carefully. I could add that the, the key to me for writing positively Fourth Street was deciding to make it the story of two sisters. And the it opens with Joan and Mimi Baez and no no men appear. Uh, There's a reference to Pete Seeger early on, but the, other, but the other characters don't appear for a while. So it's framed as a story of two rival sisters. And I had the March sisters uh, in the back of, uh, uh, my mind, and there's a couple allusions to the March sisters in the in the text, but that was the that was the key to it for me, and also the key to doing it as a form of history from above and history below, because one just two people who set out to change the world, one who did, one who did not, the one who was you know you know mo monumentally successful and one not so successful, so it gave me different uh, vantage points too. Uh, and I had to, I was fortunate to have a good editor of Harris Strauss, who first Jonathan Glassy and then Paul Eli took it up, who, who supported me uh, with that and supported my insisting on having Joan's name first in the subtitle. And you still can't say enough about Joan Baez. There's a great piece about her in the Washington Post this week, by the way. I highly recommend, as soon as this is over, read this great piece in the Washington Post. We can't say enough about her. Mm. So we can turn to the chat, but I think we've actually covered most of the questions are in there. So I just wanted to remind the audience to go ahead and put questions in there. I think we have covered a lot of them. Um, there is a longer one that came in early on. It said that um, I think it had to do with living subjects. And we talked a bit about that, but the question has to do um, was were your obligations to those who were still living and could read your book different than your obligations to those who were not? Did it feel different to you as a writer knowing, for example, that some of your subjects could speak back and argue with your account and others would not be able to? And the question is, how, did you handle those lives differently? And well I don't know if that's, yeah, that's yeah. actually a reference to my book in the question. So maybe I'll start, yeah. start yeah. briefly and yeah. then hand it over to the others. But, you know, I was trained as a journalist and went from journalism into history. So uh, 
and I teach journalism at Columbia. So the uh, importance of fair you know, fairness is always top in the top of my mind. So my, I thought as long as I'm fair to my subjects, I think, I think I'll be okay and they shouldn't have too much grounds to complain. Uh, in the case of Positively Fourth Street, I was a bit concerned about uh, how Joan might feel about it when she read it. Uh, the conclusion is that she did not like it, but never read it. She said, oh, I don't like that book. She said, what, don't, what didn't you like about it, Miss Baez? Oh, I don't know. I never read it. So I do feel I was fair and I could hold up my head, but uh, I think that's, you know, that's, that's the most important thing is, is fairness. But sometimes there are descendants who, who will object. And I know of several major biographies where the descendants tried to have the book stopped even though they had originally authorized it. And um, so you don't know, and I've run across things that I was careful not to say or to say because I knew descendants might take issue with that. I don't know if any of that, probably not in your case, Daisy, but- um. no, they no right to reply. <laughs> no, there must be, there, no, there must be some descendants. They're just a few, uh, there, in fact, a few centuries separate. Yeah. No, the people who've got in touch, there are descendants of Mary Ann Disraeli's servant, Eliza Gregory, who was a mm. blackmailer. Um, and uh, who, who, who blackmailed Mary Ann Disraeli and her descendants did get in touch to say they were delighted to find that their great, great, great aunt Eliza was a nasty little blackmailer. Um, so there are some, and that was, a, that was an unexpected correspondence, but generally no, my people don't get to, don't get to argue back. Yeah, no, it's another great question. And uh, Gretchen, it's the reason why uh, I never even, uh, uh, in this current book project with the Morgenthaus, there are so many Morgenthaus. And uh, one of the blessings is having been a journalist and still sort of consider myself a journalist, um, the only proviso I put on it was that I would not write a profile for, I was write for the New York Times Magazine on occasionally. And the only thing I said was, I don't want authorization. I don't want your blessing for this exact reason, uh, legally. And, uh, you know, uh, I was also then um, blessed with full access to everything, but without uh, any, you know, impediment to editorial independence. But I did say I won't write a magazine piece because there's something about uh, that, at least in my own experience, between a profile on the cover of the New York Times magazine or any national magazine and a book. And uh, especially having to do with a family um, and my guess is that Joan probably did read it, David. Um, uh, <laughs> my guess is that she did read it. But, uh, the, you know, there's something permanent. Uh, there's, there's something, there's a great deal. My background is really in Russia. And uh, the Russians have a great, uh, it comes from Bulgakov, that paper never burns, manuscripts never burn. And, and thank God uh, that often is the case, uh, even in our own country, that the, the permanence of uh, a narrative between two boards is something that is either reviled or respected, but you take it very seriously. Um, and you know th that I think is different than writing for a magazine, writing for a magazine. Uh, there's something about the current and you know, let alone uh, Twitter or Instagram, something about the 24 hour news cycle, um, which I think is much more feared. So we've got a few more questions in the chat now. One is, who is the abandoned reader you write for? Uh, um, and do they already know and have an interest in your group of people? Do you have an imagined reader in mind? I have an answer for this. I write for a specific person and I always have. For decades, I write for my wife, the roommate my wife had when we met. <laughs> She had a roommate, she went to Brown, she went into television production. She's a reader, but she's not like a super intellectual, but she's very smart. Uh, so her name is Anne Marie. And everything I've written since I met my wife, I've written specifically for Anne Marie. And it gives, it answers questions for me when I'm writing. Or do I have to explain who that person is? How much background do I need to give? It's, the answer for me is always, does Anne Marie know? Would Anne Marie know? But do you do you actually show it to Anne Marie? No, in fact, I never even told you. Her. <laughs> I never even told her. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> Do you I have, have nothing like I have mm -hmm. I have nothing like a specific or smart an answer. I think I I I don't make assumptions, particularly with the book I'm writing now, that people will know an awful lot about who I'm writing about. But I like to think that particularly for students or for people who are coming into the study of English literature, I like to think that my book you know can be a kind of gateway drug to the 18th century or the early 19th century that you know this might be a way of kind of getting hooked on the work so I you know I, I guess I think of the books as bait essentially for this kind of absorbing and, and extraordinary periods in literary and creative history and cultural history so I guess I would hope the my imagined reader would be someone who's kind of curious and interested but not necessarily Full of knowledge, and that yeah. So the job of biography is to wear that knowledge lightly, but but kind of really authoritatively, but to make it absorbable in a way that it allows the stories to shine. So, yeah, not 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 an individual for me, I'm afraid. Andrew, do you have a, an imagined reader? Uh, not really. I think I'm probably closer to Daisy in that um, I do read. I do write with the idea that. Um, how are we going to get people interested? How is, especially when we're looking at, um, you know, in, in American terms, Daisy, distant history uh, uh, as far back as the 1930s. Um, and when it's so uh, unfortunately forgotten um, or distorted more commonly, uh, the, the abuses of history is what I'm trying to write against. It's more what, it's more what I'm writing against. And um, I would probably, my bias is probably towards a younger audience, people who don't necessarily read, um, maybe people who don't read nonfiction at all. So this sense of a gateway drug I like, uh, I'm going to steal it, Daisy. Uh, it, it's, both, <laughs> it's both clever and funny and I think apt. Um, and I think that, you know, the, obviously the more people we can get to read uh, and to broaden out, whether it's graphic novels uh, um, or um, uh, a, a over a thousand page, there I said it, uh, work of narrative nonfiction. Um, obviously we can't be choosy and the more we can sort of, I don't know if we should say bait, but the more we can uh, attract people and, and open the door wider, uh, the better. There's a related question in the chat that says, David, were you ever tempted to put Ellington's name in the title of Lush Life so that it would potentially att attract more readers? You know, I, I follow uh, the, uh, um, advice that uh, George Gershwin gave. I can't remember who he gave it to, but George Gershwin gave some of the advice. Keep on, keep on being uncommercial. There's good money in it. Uh, and, and I've never really aimed for, you know, the market, big marketplace. So I, I, when I was writing Lost Life, which was took 11 years, I thought it was for literally 400 people. I thought there were probably four. So I was writing a book that I thought for 400 sets of eyes. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate that that has now reached 425, but uh, maybe 430. But uh, no, I never, I never was really going you know, aiming for a big readership, no. And it's beyond, something that, uh, beyond Anne Marie, books, right? <laughs> uh, there are enough books about Ellington already. This this whole shelf is all about Ellington. Those those thirty five books are enough. Uh, the, with thirty five about uh, Ellington, there could be one about Billy Strayhorn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can keep going beyond three if we want to. So feel free to keep putting questions into the chat, or you can even um, in, um, have some direct questions if you would like to unmute, to unmute yourself for a little bit. Um, but one question is, any tips about structure beyond what's been said already? My only answer to that would be that the structure would depend on the book that you're writing. You have, not every book would follow the same structure, but are there any tips that you can offer to biographers out there? I think you have to listen to your material. I think you have to listen and listen and listen to your material and take your lead from that, which I think is what you've just said, really, Gretchen, isn't it? But you yeah. have to tune in to your material. And I think the structure's there. I think it's helpful to know where you plan to end up. It, I always 
have the ending in mind. I know how the book will end before I write the first sentence. Mm. And then that helps me structurally as I'm organizing the materials and writing. I know where it's going to go. What's it's that? just that you do, do you know how you're going to get there? I like, I think like, like everyone here on the panel, I had structure obsessively. I made mm -hmm. had an outline of over a hundred pages for each single space over a hundred pages for each chapter of each of my books before mm -hmm. I made actual sense <laughs> for writing prose, just organization, just structure. So I have the whole thing mapped out before I write makes sense. That's just me. Other people work different ways and clearly it, you know, things work equally well for different I, people. That's what I, I It's fascinating to hear, David. I, uh, I wish I worked that way. I came across um, the uh, my first sketch uh, for this book, Morgenthau book, which I've said, I'll say it again, is over a thousand pages long. Um, <laughs> I had sketched out 13 chapters uh, I now have somewhere upwards of 75. They're short chapters, uh, but I wish I had been able to um, uh, plan it and plot it that carefully. Um, I think the only advice I would give on structure is don't panic. Don't panic. Um, and if you have uh, 10 books on your shelf that you love, um, look at how they are structured. Um, take them apart and really look at how the pieces fit together as you would a car or a toaster um, or a good meal and and then do it something different. Uh, the one my battle with structure um, is when, uh, you know, you're so far out in, in any type of writing, fiction or otherwise, is transatlantic sailing uh, solo, um, almost always solo. And it, well, you're trying to navigate by the stars at night uh, and when you're really lost, and it's usually in my case about structure, go to sleep and then look at it a day or two later. And you'll find out, wait a minute, at least in my case, that actually works. It's not always planned. I mean, I do have chapters and I do have sections and I do have scenes and you do end of that. Um, but often when you think, it's usually around three in the morning, what the heck am I writing? Where am I? I'm not in the weeds. I'm in a different universe. And then give it a day or two. Don't panic, which is advice easy given and hard to take. Um, and come back to it and you think, oh, okay, that bit works. That bit doesn't work. Uh, and you can save. And then I'm just ruthlessly, I'm a ruthless cutter. Um, but uh, I would say don't panic. Well, it's interesting you said that. And I think you mentioned it earlier, but a question has just come in for you, Andrew saying, did you have to cut some of the book to fit it into those 1,000 pages? Yes, I think it's fair to say. Uh, that's why it's taken me over nine months. Um, uh, I had a very active uh, lockdown uh, to cut, to cut a, a good book from the book, uh, which again, you know, I have a friend, I have a lot of, for some reason, living in Brooklyn, everyone I know is a novelist. Uh, a, or a poet or both. And I have a novelist friend and she said, oh, that's nothing. I wrote uh, over 300 pages about a character and she's one paragraph in the novel <laughs> that's published, one paragraph. And to me, that's not paradoxical. That makes perfect sense. Um, and it's only, you know, biography, David Levering Lewis said it uh, to me years ago, biography is the art of subtraction. Uh, and certainly group biography and family biographies all the more so. Uh, you have to be ruthless about uh, what you're cutting out, but mindful of those who have been left out previously, you know, those that you can bring back onto the stage. Um, Daisy, were there things that you found you had to cut in order to stay true to the structure or the sense that you wanted to give one of your books? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this last book is also very long and has had much more cut out of it. But with the um, with with both books, it's so easy when you're working on kind of big archival projects to think that everything that you found is fascinating. And uh, that that the, the, the discipline that comes with saying, well, is this really pertinent to the story I want to tell is a really important part of it. So uh, I had an early draft of the current book at the beginning of last year and I looked at it and it was all foreground you know it was all it was all happening at one level and there was no kind of out of that it you know this it, I needed to still do that relief work on it 
which is you know, again about subtraction, um, often around giving less space to particular voices in order to create more space for a kind of a kind of narrative voice or a kind of narrative line. Um, but I think for me, the things that I've often overused to begin with have been the voices of the people I've been writing about. And you've got to be able to kind of capture that on the page quite speedily, really, in order for not just to overwhelm the text. And that's the balance I've always found tricky. There's a, a follow-up question in the chat. How much of the cutting did you do yourselves and how much was suggested by your editors? Because that's the other pair of eyes that we we need to think about is what your editor thinks. I I rewrote my last book five times mm -hmm. because of things that the editor wanted or suggested or new directions. Um, and, you know, I, I tell my students this all the time, you know, if they think it's painful to revise one paper, you know, I think, what if it's a whole book? But did your editors suggest the, the cuts or the changes or the direction? What is the role of the editor in, in a group biography in particular? Daisy, you mentioned you had a really excellent editor. Yeah, I mean, I learned an awful lot working with Paul Eli at FFG on my first book. One of the things that Paul got me to cut was what he called the scaffolding, the kind of narrative transitions. I can see David nodding. I feel like he had this conversation too. But the kind of narrative transitions, which for me would link the mood, the, the different parts of narrative. You know, I would cut from Lee Hunt in his prison cell and I would write a transitional sentence which would get me to Shelley sitting in his house in Marlow. And Paul Eli got me to cut all of that out. He said, that's the scaffolding, that's the keystone. You knock that away now, now that you've built the book. And mm -hmm. it was such an important lesson to learn. And it's something, again, I repeat, like it, because I, you know, like, I like it with my idea to my own students too, and my own life writing students as well. Um, and I think that, I mean, it, what an editor can do is to say, all right, you know all about these stuff, you know the stuff, but I can see the story. And particularly with this last book too, my editor has been really, really, really crucial figure in saying, this, I want the story, you know? Yeah, okay, you know all the, all the facts, but you know, this is, this is what's important for the story. I and mean, that's what they're, you know, that's where the craft is. I've been really, really lucky. I worked with Clara Farmer at FSG and also with Jenny Uglo, who you know, was at um, Chateau and just before, and who said to me very early on with this book, you have to understand how everyone in this period how they live their religion. You know, this kind of idea, this kind of editorial idea, also incredibly expert scholarly idea there, which you then, again, drives you forward. So I've been really, really lucky. We had the one of the same editors. So Paul was editor on, on, on most of my work there, but also, also Jonathan Galassi in my first book. And they were both very good at removing text that was too much about me and my cleverness and in uh, the wonder of, you know, my skill with language and all that, you know, they were very good at purging the book of that. And I, when I, I submitted the, I, I don't think anybody works this way anymore, but when I wrote Lush Life, I submitted the first half to Jonathan and I got back to edit, it was really quite light, but he had, he had deleted the first sentence. So I called him and I said, Jonathan, uh, you cut the first sentence. You know, I spent a day on that. <laughs> he said, yeah, I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, that's, great. that's great. I'm going to um, invite anyone out there, if anybody wants to unmute him or herself um, and just say something or ask a question that's not in the chat, um, we can do that now. Um, we have a few more minutes if people want to stay on, but if not, um, so we'll give that a moment. I am going to have to go at three fifteen. Just so that's all right. We're going to wind this up, but I just wanted to see if there's if if absent that, if anybody has some final remarks um, for anybody or aspiring group biographers or those currently in the throws of it. Any final remarks before we close this out? Thank you, Gretchen, for pushing the panel together. It's been really, really fascinating <laughs> to hear Andrew and David talk and to hear you talk too. Mm. Yeah. Yes, wonderful.
Thank you. I think I think that I think we could certainly talk for a lot longer uh, and learn a lot from each other. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Gretchen, as well. And thank no, you, everyone, in bio. Everyone. Yes, yes. We have no links to it, but there is a bookshop, I think, somehow connected to the conference where people can, I'm, I think, um, how people can. So hopefully we'll get plugs in for all of and your books. David, I'm looking forward to your Martin Scorsese bio. <laughs> <laughs> we may have to wait, you know, God willing. We, we, he's got another uh, few decades to go, but uh, yeah. I hope you're patient. Right. <laughs> so thank you all of you it's been wonderful i really appreciate you being on this panel i loved hearing about how you work and um your current and future projects so thank everybody thank you thank you thank you bye-bye